nothing has shaped the life of the Hawkesbury district more than the river for which it is named. In fact, the district exists today because of the Hawkesbury Nepean River. However, the river has been both the saviour and the scourge of the district, its lifeblood and its curse. Since 1799, there have been 123 recorded floods in the Hawkesbury Nepean Valley. The floodplain area encompasses a number of major residential and commercial centres, including Penrith, Emu Plains, Windsor, Richmond and Bly Park. Around 56,000 people, 17,000 homes and 3,600 businesses and industries are potentially affected by flooding. A number of rivers cascade down from the Blue Mountains onto the floodplain, where they are joined by creeks that drain stormwater from large residential areas of Western Sydney. In times of flood, a mass of water sweeps across this floodplain, pausing a while in the valley before slowly squeezing through nearly 100 kilometres of narrow gorge country on the flood's final thrust to the sea. The Hawkesbury Nepean Valley is often likened to a bathtub, where the inflow of water from a number of sources exceeds the capacity of the bathtub to drain away those waters. Waters then rise rapidly and to a great height. This can result in low-lying bridges and roads being cut, with large population centres surrounded and marooned by rapidly rising floodwaters. The largest flood in the valley since European settlement happened in June 1867 when the river rose 19 metres, or 63 feet, at Windsor. The flood, which took 13 lives, wreaked enormous havoc on the infant colony of Sydney. The flood was well documented, and there are numerous markers and plaques throughout the valley, which bear silent witness to the terrible flood. During this century, development in the valley has accelerated. A repeat of the 1867 flood, which has a similar risk of occurring as the 1990 Ningen flood, would devastate the valley. Major residential and commercial centres such as Windsor, Richmond, McGrath Hill, Penrith and Emu Plains would be inundated. A repeat of the 1867 flood on record would affect 8,000 homes and 1,600 businesses, requiring the evacuation of up to 42,000 people. The damages bill would be around $1.2 billion. By far the largest river system that flows into the valley is the Warragamba River. On that river stands Warragamba Dam. Construction commenced on the dam after the Second World War and was completed in 1960. At 142 metres high and containing more than 3 million tonnes of concrete, it is the largest concrete gravity dam in Australia and one of the largest water supply dams in the world. Warragamba Dam holds back about four times the volume of Sydney Harbour. 70% of the water supply to the nearly four million residents of Sydney comes from this one dam. It is vitally important to everyone in Sydney. The dam was constructed with a 90 metre wide central spillway with five floodgates. The floodgates in the spillway are only designed to protect the dam structure itself, not to reduce the effects of flooding downstream in the valley. During the 1980s, as part of an ongoing review, the safety of Warragamba Dam was reassessed. Even though Warragamba Dam had been constructed to comply with the relevant standards applicable during the 1940s and 50s, 
the dam fell short of the revised international dam safety standards. As a result of advances in the sciences of meteorology and hydrology, especially rainfall and flood predictions, it was revealed that the spillway of the dam had a serious deficiency in its flood handling ability. A large-scale hydraulic model of the dam was used to test the ability of the dam to safely pass floodwaters. These tests reveal that while the dam could handle the majority of flood events, the dam would be overtopped and could collapse in extremely large floods. Dam failure would have a catastrophic impact on the 56,000 people who live below the dam on the valley floodplain. Between 1987 and 1989, Sydney Water Corporation commenced the first stage of a two-stage program to bring the dam up to the required safety standards, thus protecting the dam and securing Sydney's water supply. At a cost of $28 million, the crest of the dam was raised by five metres. The dam was further strengthened by the installation of a series of post-tension steel cables. The construction did not increase normal water storage levels, but has improved the capability of the dam to cope with larger flood levels. Stage two of the project, to bring the dam fully up to the required safety standards, was to involve the construction of a massive auxiliary or side spillway around the heightened and strengthened dam. However, it was during the subsequent evaluation of the environmental impact of this proposed side spillway that the serious implications of the increased flood risk to the valley communities became known. Soon after, flood mitigation was placed firmly on the agenda. In a process that took more than seven years, over 20 proposals to provide both flood control or mitigation and dam safety were considered. The flood mitigation strategies included straightening and realigning parts of the Hawkes-Brinopean River, deepening the riverbed by 10 metres, constructing huge levee banks along the river to contain floodwaters, building flood retention dams on the rivers draining into the dam, a massive bypass channel around the dam, an upstream flood mitigation dam, or a mitigation dam immediately downstream of Warragamba Dam, lowering the normal storage level of Warragamba Dam, so creating a buffer for floodwaters. Finally, in 1994, and following the recommendations from a special task force, the New South Wales Government announced a plan to mitigate the effects of flooding on Warragamba Dam and on the people in the Hawkes-Brinopean Valley. The Government plan is in three parts. First, the State Emergency Service was to develop a detailed flood emergency plan specifying safety procedures during flooding. Second, a coordinated floodplain management plan being developed by state and local government authorities to minimise the risks and consequences of flooding in the valley. And thirdly, the construction of a flood mitigation dam on the Warragamba River. The government's preferred scheme is to raise the height of the existing dam wall by 23 metres, thus combining dam safety and flood mitigation in the one scheme. The mitigation dam will reduce peak flooding levels by up to four and a half metres in a repeat of the 1867 flood. It's been estimated that it will reduce flood damages by an average of $24 million every year. 
Modifying Warragamba Dam, however, is a major project. Around one and a half million tonnes of concrete, equivalent to half the concrete used in the construction of the original dam, will need to be added. The downstream face of the dam is thickened by up to 14 metres of concrete. The dam wall is raised by 23 metres. And the spillway is modified by removing the existing floodgates and replacing them with large ducts or conduits. These huge conduits, large enough to drive a bus through, will be cast in the dam wall below the existing full storage level. After the flood peak in the valley has passed, the gates on these large conduits are opened to allow the temporarily detained floodwaters to flow down the valley, returning the lake to its normal full storage level as soon as possible. This proposal will cost $279 million and take about four years to build. The raised dam will not be used to increase Sydney's water supply. Constructing the flood mitigation dam and modifying the flow of flood waters will affect the environment. To determine what these effects are, an environmental impact statement is currently being prepared by Sydney Water Corporation as the owner of Warragamba Dam. The effects of the flood mitigation dam can be divided into three parts. Impact on the Warragamba Dam site and local communities during construction. Impact on the upstream environment from the floodwaters temporarily held back by the mitigation dam. Impact on the downstream environment as the controlled release of floodwaters extends the period of flooding. It is expected that the Environmental Impact Statement, or EIS, will be released for public comment in July 1995. The EIS will be on display for three months, after which time the government will decide on whether to go ahead with the flood mitigation proposal. If the government approves the project, preliminary construction work should begin in 1996 with the project scheduled for completion in the year 2000. While the project will not altogether eliminate the effects of flooding in the Hawkesbury-Napean Valley, it will provide significant reductions in flood levels with major economic and social It could happen any time, when the rains come to the Blue Mountains and fall in unrelenting torrents, day after day. And during the deluge that follows, this playground, the orange grove over there, these businesses would be engulfed by a flood as a mass of water equivalent to one and a half times the capacity of Sydney Harbour sweeps across this floodplain pausing a while in the valley while the waters slowly squeeze through a hundred kilometers of narrow gorge country to the north on the flood's final thrust to the sea. Such a flood, the largest on record, occurred in 1867. And this marker shows how high it came, reaching its peak at five o'clock on Sunday morning, June the 23rd, engulfing this entire valley, much of Richmond, Windsor and Penrith, and most of the small farms and settlements in between. The huge horizontal area covered by the 1867 flood is just part of the story. The unique topography of the Hawkesbury-Napean Valley also causes floodwaters to bank up to enormous depths. Where I'm standing now near the Windsor Bridge would have been entirely covered by a raging torrent of water. I would have had to swim straight up 20 metres just to reach the surface of the flooded Hawkesbury River. 
Since 1799, there have been 123 recorded floods in this valley, or about one every 18 months. Floods such as the 1867 flood are a rare event. There's about a one in 280 chance per year of such a massive flood, but they do occur. The recent Ningen flood was just such an episode. History, however, shows that even smaller, more likely floods will cause extensive damage unless the effects of flooding are controlled or mitigated. This program looks at the reasons for such flooding and the plans to manage and mitigate the effects of the flooding on the 56,000 people who live in the floodplain. It also looks at some of the advantages and disadvantages of the efforts to mitigate the effects of flooding in the Hawkesbury Nepean Valley. In presenting this program to you, I'd like to encourage you to have your say in this vital public decision. Take the next 20 minutes to learn how this project could affect you and then have your say. The first farmers came to the Hawkesbury Nepean Valley within two years of European settlement. It soon became obvious that flooding was a regular occurrence here, causing property damage but also enriching the valley's soil with fertile layers of silt. So, floods became known as both a saviour and as a scourge to the valley's European settlers. During this century, development has accelerated. Until today, there are more than 17,000 homes and 56,000 people exposed to flooding in the hawkesbury Nepean Valley floodplain in the worst possible scenario. Agriculture remains important. Over 3,600 businesses have established here. Hundreds of millions of dollars have been invested in public infrastructure. Suburbs like Bly Park, McGrath Hill and Windsor Downs have been recently established and are expanding rapidly. And each of these new suburbs would be flooded if another 1867 flood occurs. Flooding in the valley, which incidentally is not usually covered in insurance policies, can cause hundreds of millions of dollars damage and disruption to the lives of people who live in the Hawkesbury Nepean Valley. High up in the Blue Mountains, the river that brings down over 50% of this floodwater is the Warragamba River. In the late 1940s, construction of a major dam commenced. The concrete wall of Warragamba Dam holds back two million million litres of water, or about four times the volume of Sydney Harbour. Seventy percent of the water we drink comes through one of these pipes. So this dam is vital to everyone who lives in Sydney. When Warragamba was built, a spillway was constructed to prevent water from overtopping the dam during a flood. The floodgates and spillway were only designed to protect the dam structure itself not to reduce the effects of flooding in the valley downstream. To reduce such risk, a flood mitigation dam would be necessary. During a flood, water would be held back behind the mitigation dam and would be progressively released after the peak flood in the valley has passed. The floodwaters detention and controlled release, or flood mitigation, would dramatically reduce the severity of flooding and allows more time for evacuations. It's important to realise that the flood mitigation dam would not be used to increase the capacity to permanently store drinking water. It's not designed to be storage by stealth. The floodwaters would be released as soon as possible to enable the dam to cope with further flooding rains. Such floods can occur one after another, often in the same month. Here, three major floods happened in rapid succession in February 1956. The flood risk is much greater than had been thought in the past. Uh, the flood levels are much higher uh, for a given level of risk and uh, that obviously means that uh, many more people are at uh, risk from flooding than we had thought in the past. So what would flood mitigation mean here in the Hawkesbury Nepean Valley? Flood mitigation could potentially save 1.2 billion dollars in damage and disruption in an 1867-style flood. It may save lives by reducing the height and speed of the floodwaters as they surge through the valley. 
but flood mitigation would require major changes to the existing dam. Such structural changes would also upgrade the Warragamba Dam to the current international dam safety standards. We've grouped all the data together. We've got a better feel for the rarer events than we had previously. We're able to put more accurate numbers to those. And as a consequence, we're now ending up with rainfall numbers that are considerably higher than were previously calculated, but they're also indicative of far rarer events than was the case beforehand. The increased data has, has resulted in numbers that may be 50% higher than were those that calculated in the initial studies back in the 50s. This new scientific research has been verified by three independent international scientific reviews. So, in 1994, the Government of New South Wales formulated a plan to mitigate the effects of flooding on the Warragamba Dam and the people of the Hawkesbury Nepean Valley. The Government plan is in three parts. First, a detailed flood emergency plan has been developed already by the State Emergency Service. It specifies safety procedures during floods. Second, a coordinated floodplain management plan involving state and local government is being developed to minimise the risks and consequences of flooding on the valley community. And finally, the construction of a flood mitigation dam on the Warragamba River is proposed. Extensive research into possible flood mitigation schemes were judged by four criteria. Flood mitigation. How effectively did the scheme reduce the risk and severity of flooding in the valley? Dam safety. How secure was the dam and Sydney's water supply? Environmental impact. How did the scheme affect the dam site and regions upstream and downstream of the dam? Value. What was the ratio between benefit and cost. In a process that took more than seven years, the government considered over 20 proposals to provide both flood mitigation and dam safety. The flood mitigation strategies included flood water detention dams on one or more of the rivers draining into Lake Baragarang, reducing the normal storage level in Lake Baragarang, so creating a buffer for flood water behind the existing dam constructing huge levee banks on the Hawkesbury River to contain floodwaters, deepening and straightening the river in the floodplain, and raising and strengthening the existing dam wall, holding back floodwaters for later controlled release. The government's preferred option is to raise the height of the existing dam wall, combining dam safety and flood mitigation in the one scheme. This scheme is based on raising the dam by 23 metres. This proposal would create a flood mitigation airspace above the lake equivalent to eight times the volume of Sydney Harbour. So, with this mitigation dam in place, the effects of flooding in the Hawkesbury Nepean Valley would be dramatically reduced. At Windsor, these are the flood levels without flood mitigation for a 1 in 20 chance per year flood, a 1 in 280 chance per year flood, equivalent to the 1867 flood, here are the levels with the new Warragamba Flood Mitigation Dam. The area affected by flooding is also significantly reduced. The mitigation dam would reduce peak flooding levels by up to four and a half metres in a repeat of the 1867 flood. And it's been estimated that it would reduce flood damages by an average of $24 million each year. And it would bring flood waters in a repeat of the 1867 flood to below the 1994 planning level, ensuring that about 6,500 homes, which would be inundated by an 1867 flood, would be saved from flooding. The mitigation dam would also reduce the thunderous power of flood waters as they gush out of the mountains and envelop Penrith and Emu Plains, slowing the onset of flooding, thereby making the flood more manageable. Modifying the Warragamba Dam, however, is a major project. The downstream face of the dam is thickened by up to 14 metres of concrete. The dam wall is raised 23 metres and the existing 90 metre wide spillway is modified with pipes large enough to drive a bus through cast in the dam wall below the existing full storage level. The raised spillway would hold back floodwaters equal to double the volume of Sydney Harbour or the kind of flood that has a 1 in 50 chance per year of happening. 
larger floods would build up in the lake behind the raised dam wall, equivalent to a further six Sydney harbours, but floods of this level are discharged freely over the spillway crest. After the flood peak in the valley has passed, the gates on these large pipes would be opened to allow backed up flood water to flow down the valley, returning Lake Burragarang back to its normal full storage level as soon as is possible. This proposal would cost $279 million and take about four years to build. And while it wouldn't eliminate the effects of flooding in the hawkesbury Nepean Valley, it would have significant economic and social benefits. The flood mitigation dam would reduce the risk of wholesale evacuation in floods and it would reduce the danger to life in the event of major flooding. In the process, Warragamba Dam itself would be upgraded to full international safety standards protecting the water supply of the three and three quarter million Sydney siders who rely on it for water. Constructing the dam and modifying the flow of floodwaters would affect the environment. To determine what these effects are, an environmental impact statement, an EIS, has been prepared. The effects of the flood mitigation dam can be divided into three parts impact on the Warragamba dam site and local communities during construction, impact on the upstream environment from the floodwater temporarily held back by the mitigation dam, impact on the downstream environment as the controlled release of floodwaters extends the period of flooding. At the dam, one and a half million tonnes of concrete would be poured, involving around 115 round trips a day by trucks at the peak of the project. Residents would also be affected by some noise from the construction site, which would operate late into the night. Consultation with the local community has already taken place, and plans to reroute traffic away from the school came from these discussions. Roads into the township would also be upgraded at a cost of around $4 million. Several native species have been sighted near the dam site, including a small colony of rare and endangered brush-tailed rock wallabies and common planigale. Strategies for the management of these native animals during the construction periods are being developed. During periods of flooding, the level of Lake Burragarang rises to above its normal level. It drains quickly, causing little damage to the environment. However, with the 23-metre flood mitigation dam, waters would flood the shores of Lake Burragarang to much higher levels, although still only temporarily. How will this affect the environment here in the upstream valley? Some Aboriginal sites, such as stone artefacts and scarred trees, would be affected by this temporary flooding, and discussions with the local Aboriginal land councils are underway to minimise the impacts on this heritage. However, some sites downstream would also benefit from a flood mitigation dam. Animal species on the lake shore are unlikely to be affected by temporary flooding. Generally, animals are capable of moving away from the rising floodwaters, but there may be some cases when rapid flooding could trap or engulf individual animals. However, there could be some changes in vegetation to a limited area around the lake. In the worst case, in the few metres above the full storage level of the lake, temporary flooding could occur often enough and for long enough to cause a different mix of plants to eventually grow. In the rest of the zone liable to flooding, changes in vegetation are considered to be very unlikely because floodwaters would reach these heights rarely and the water wouldn't stay there long enough to damage the vegetation. The potential loss of any vegetation needs careful evaluation, especially here on the foreshore of Lake Burragarang, which is largely pristine bushland. A number of important rivers flow into Lake Burragarang, including the Wallandilly, the Coxes, the Kalmung and the Natai. The impact on the ecosystems of these rivers also needs careful evaluation. These areas contain specimens of nine rare and vulnerable plants. Important populations of the Camden whitegum and the Hakea species too. There are 7,000 Camden whitegum in the affected area one of only two stands remaining in their natural state. The Hakea species too consists of a number of small shrubs, of which about 30 will be affected by flooding. 
Already a seed collection and regeneration program is underway, and the CSIRO is testing the Camden gums for their tolerance to flooding. While periodic flooding would occur in this area, no vegetation would be removed as part of the flood mitigation strategy. There may be some change to the number of individual species, but it's believed no particular species would be lost. So to gain the benefits that flood mitigation offers to the community downstream, there is a disadvantage, a possible change to the mix of species in a limited area of the bushland on the edge of the lake. Downstream, there are also a number of impacts. Because a mitigated flood is discharged more slowly, roads and bridges may be cut for longer periods. Industries like sand and gravel mining and turf farming may also be affected by these longer flood release times. Certain parts of the river banks will be underwater longer, possibly affecting some plants and trees that have less tolerance to flooding. Although there's expected to be little effect on fauna, flooding's already a fact of life for animals who live near the river banks. Further downstream, oyster farms and fisheries in these estuaries which rely on salt water to keep seafood stocks alive, would be affected by extended periods of freshwater flooding. So, it's a balancing act. A quick release causes more damage, but it allows the floodwaters to pass more quickly. A slow release reduces the damage, but extends the period of flooding. There's no easy answer, and trade-offs will have to be made by the community at large. For this reason, it's important that you have your say in the community consultation process. Various release rates of up to three million litres per second, that's about half of Sydney Harbour in a day, have been tested using computer simulations. The results from these tests are published in the EIS, allowing you to examine them and to make suggestions on the optimum release rate for the floodwaters. The Hawkesbury Nepean Valley Flood Mitigation Plan has now reached the stage where the environmental impact statement has been released for public comment. An information booklet is available free of charge, and the full document is available for inspection or purchase. A list showing where the environmental impact statement is available follows this program. The EIS will be on display for three months, and you're invited to comment on it in writing. And then the government will decide whether to proceed with the flood mitigation proposal. A proposal designed to significantly reduce flood risk for thousands of people living in the Hawkesbury Nepean Valley and designed to ensure the safety of the dam while protecting Sydney's water supply. The issues involved in mitigating the effects of flooding in the Hawkesbury Nepean Valley are complex ones. On the one hand, we know that severe flooding will occur from time to time. We also know that flooding will cause significant damage, dislocation and even possibly loss of life. On the other hand, we know that efforts to mitigate the effects of flooding will also have costs, environmental, social and financial costs. Each of us must balance up the advantages of this proposal and its disadvantages and make our own informed decision. For each of us has a role to play in the government's final decision on this proposed flood mitigation dam. This video has simply outlined the proposal. It's up to you to make a contribution.